Thank you, sir. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here and to introduce uh, uh, some of the areas that we are going to be talking about today. My, uh, my story that I'm trying to tell you today is not, uh, not a deeply technical one. I want to kind of impress on you how, uh, how complicated, how everywhere, how omnipresent the threat of cyber attacks are, and to kind of give you an understanding of what exactly it means and what people can do and what we should do uh, on, on that direction. Ready for my slides to come up? Thank you. Okay, so uh, let, let me start by talking a little bit about, I apologize, by the way, for the si size of the font. So you don't have to read it. I, I will explain what I want to remember. Uh, the internet is, of course, part of, a, a, a part of everything now. Uh, and as was shown earlier, we actually celebrated 50 years of the internet's uh, start about a couple, of months, a couple of weeks ago. It was in October. And now what has happened is uh, the internet is something that we really don't, cannot live without. Every part of life is connected to the internet. Whether it is the way you come here uh, with traffic, whether it is the way you do mapping, whether it is the way you find services, whether you find information, distribute information, everything is constantly connected. So, so what we've had is we've moved to a model where uh, the, the dependency on the network is always there. So we, we really cannot live without the network. I'm sure everyone here has a smartphone. And by, by having a smartphone, you're always connected to the internet. What that means is your location is always known to the, the, the technology provider of that smartphone. Uh, the cell phone operator already knows that because that by, that's how the signaling works. But beyond that, now the operator of the technology also knows where the location is. They also can know that there are so many people gathered here right now. <clears throat> and when they know whose phones are there, they can kind of figure out what's, what this meeting is about because the kind of people gathered have a, some common, common thread between them. So there's a lot of information that goes out because you are connected to the internet. Being connected constantly is also a huge risk because everything is connected means now you're completely dependent on that. And if you don't have the connection, you can't survive. So being connected becomes a vulnerability point. And in Sri Lanka, we are an island. So when you're an island, we are connected through a few submarine cables and, and a satellite connection. So we are extremely dependent on those connectivity being there always. Otherwise, we. We don't have, uh, you know, we become an island again. Uh, the, the fact that a lot of information is available, the, the thing I just told you about your cell phone, right? there's a lot of people in the world that know this meeting is happening, uh, and who's in the room because the phone, phone information is there. So when you can capture that kind of data, a lot of analytics can be derived from that, and then that information can be abused for various purposes. So the, the connectivity of the internet, while it brings incredible benefit for humanity, and it's something we cannot ever back away from, and we will never back away from. It's only going to get more and more connected. The, the impact it has on threats in terms of how vulnerable you are because you're now part of an entire global ecosystem and no longer something that is isolated is very, very real. So, so that's something very important to understand with regards to why this topic has come up now. Uh, there's also this term called digital transformation that gets used quite a bit these days. And what that means is something similar to the Industrial Revolution that happened uh, you know, a few hundred years ago. Uh, digital transformation is the application of digital technology to every part of life, uh, whether how government works, whether military works, uh, healthcare is delivered, education is delivered, uh, information accessed, everything is becoming digital now. And what that digital transformation does is, again, increase significant dependency on, on connectivity and technology. But Digital transformation is incredibly beneficial because what it does is it makes things that were much more difficult much easier. It improves productivity. It reduces the time it takes to do something. It makes it very, very tangible uh, benefit of what this internet thing is. This transformation concept, the, the terminology of digital transformation is fairly new. It started maybe three, four years ago. Uh, but obviously, we've been in that process. And now, with the extremely low cost of computing hardware, extremely low cost of bandwidth, this is now we are in full steam. The expectation is within the next 10 to 20 years, everything will be digital. Every single part of life, every communication, every interaction, every activity will be digitally connected. Once that happens, the dependency on digital technology is even worse. And even if you look at Sri Lanka, there's actually a lot of digital transformation activity going on in Sri Lanka. Uh, the government has lots of different programs going on. The, we have something called the Lanka Government Cloud, which is a, a shared compute infrastructure. There's actually two versions of it running now. 
uh, that's available for government services to use. There's the Lanka government network. Uh, there's all kinds of different uh, systems that have been built by different parts of government, everything from healthcare, uh, education, and so forth. And every other part that's missing is, is under development right now. Right? So, so what that means is government is more and more becoming digital. And, and we don't all see it yet because it's not fully connected, but it's getting there. And it'll take time, but it will get there. Uh, private industry, if you look at private industry in Sri Lanka, uh, everything is very, very digital. If you look at the travel industry, if the internet doesn't work, the travel industry will grind to a halt. Right? Everything from Uber to Airbnb to hotel reservations to all the communication you do with customers, everything goes through the internet. So everything depends on that. Finance, uh, banking, if you go to a bank and pull money from an ATM, it's no longer a separate line to that ATM. They're just connected to the internet. Right? They just go over the internet to the banking services. Uh, retail is more and more like that. There's a lot of e e electronic commerce happening in Sri Lanka now, and also more and more other services are becoming uh, digitally connected retail providers. And, 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 and so on. Every, every part of the society is being digitally transformed, even in Sri Lanka. And, and we are a little bit behind in some other countries, but, uh, but we are catching up very fast. So wh where does this bring us to cyber? Now, this has already been mentioned. The idea that cyber is considered an entirely different theater of war. So there's sea, land, air, and, and then there's cyber. And cyber is a, a, something very different from our usual kind of warfare, because in normal warfare, there's a well-defined participants in, in, in warfare. In the world of cyber, none of those things exist. Uh, first of all, there's no difference between a state actor and a non-state actor. Right? So that is, a, a, you don't need to have a government, you don't need to be a military, you don't need to be an organization to be a player in the cyber warfare world. Anybody can be. And anybody is becoming like that. So non-state actors means they're individuals, private organizations, uh, private groups, people with various interests who choose to do something simply because they don't agree with something and they can do it. Uh, and the other part is it can attack anytime and anywhere. That's why the tagline of this conference is the one that says it's perpetual warfare. Because unlike in other forms of warfare where you need to prepare and you need to prepare logistics, you have to put a lot of infrastructure in place before you can take a step forward, this, is, this infrastructure is always in place. The, the ability to attack is just a matter of deciding that it's, I want to go after these people. The underlying infrastructure you need to make some kind of a digital attack is always in place. And it never goes down, it never goes going out for maintenance or whatever. Uh, size also doesn't matter. One person can take down an entire country's infrastructure. Uh, if they know what they're doing and if they have the right kind of uh, tools available. You, of course, the, the, the larger countries, the larger organizations have built up all kinds of capabilities, both for offensive and defensive capability. So there are larger and larger teams now. But what really matters is the capacity of the individual and the capacity of the people, not the size of the, the organization they're part of, or size of the country, or size of the budget. It is something that anyone can participate in. The, the scale of attacks can go from individual targeted attacks, where you go after one person and you kind of take them out of the internet, or you can take it to a country level. So every spectrum is available. So it's, it's kind of a, a complete broad range of attack vectors that are possible and the kind of targets that you're going after. And another big, big part is that defense responsibility is no longer a particular responsibility of a particular part of a, or a state, basically. Right? It's no longer military only that can defend against cyber warfare because every company that has an internet presence is a target of cyber warfare. And if you haven't been attacked yet, it's simply because you're boring if you're a company. Right? Any company that is interesting to the world gets attacked. That's the bottom line. If you haven't been attacked, eh, you're not relevant. If you're relevant, somebody will take you down or go after you one way or the other. And when you become relevant, you are going to get attacked. That means whether it is an a, uh, electricity provider or whatever the thing it is, as long as you're not relevant, no problem. The moment you become visible, somebody's going to come after you. And so you're always at war. No, there's no rest, there's no time out, there's no you know, recycle, reboot, nothing. Always at war in this world. And the other part is most of the people who are in cyber warfare don't wear a uniform. They don't follow a code of conduct, they don't have rules, they don't have discipline, it doesn't matter. They have very different kind of discipline than what we are used to in a military kind of organization structure. Uh, and and they, they know what they're doing, they have objectives, they have goals, and they go after those goals. That's it. And, and they choose what the priorities are. For example, there's a group called Anonymous, which is a very well-known hacking group. Uh, no one really knows who's even part of this group. And they choose, they decide a particular activity is not OK. And once they decide that particular activity is not OK, they go after the people who are behind that activity. 
So there's no international law, there's no, you know, uh, conventions apply, nothing. If they don't like it, that's tough luck, basically. And in fact, uh, most militaries, I think the British military now has a cyber warfare unit which doesn't require the same kind of physical uh, requirements as for those soldiers as they do for other soldiers because the capacity that you need to fight in this world is much more intellectual than physical. The fact that you can sit in front of a keyboard for days and end with long hair is okay in that world. Right. You don't need to have short hair to fight this battle. Right. You don't need to be fit to be able to do push-ups and, and sit-ups to be able to fight this battle. Very different world. Let me just take you through a few examples just to make this very concrete, right? So I, this was an attack in Alaska, in a, in a small city in Alaska just a couple of months ago. Uh, it was a ransomware attack. And this is kind of funny because they basically, this is a ransomware, I think we, we had a similar ransomware attack some time ago. Uh, this, uh, this software basically encrypted all, this, all the content on the city's infrastructure, all of it. And in fact, they had paid to get out of it. Because they couldn't, they had no way to get out of it. So recently, it was announced that they actually paid to basically paid ransom uh, to to get the encryption decryption keys and to get out of it, right? And they had to go down to typewriters and handwritten receipts and so forth to run the city when this was attacked. Right? And this was just a couple of months ago. Uh, uh, everybody said about the the election hacking uh, stories about Russia versus U.S. and so forth, but this is not a Russia versus U.S. thing. Uh, you know, U.S. government admitted they have hacked more than 80 different elections. Uh, and, and so forth, right? Sri Lanka was on the list. So, so this is, and, and there's not just US government, everybody does it. And it's just information warfare. This is targeted information delivery and distribution and, and management, so you change people's minds. So you don't have to hack an election by hacking the voting machine. You hack the election by hacking people's minds into thinking something that is not true. It's much easier to do that than to hack the voting machine. And you can do it at scale and you can do it in a targeted way because with analytics, you can target the message to each individual person exactly saying this person believes this kind of thing, let me give them something they want to hear. Right? Because they believe this stuff, they will automatically believe it. Uh, this was another one, this was a, uh, this was a, 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 a sort of a, for married people to have an affair site, and this entire site was hacked, and what that meant was that data is available for blackmail. Now if you were married and you had an affair on the site, now somebody knows that you had it, if you want this site. Sit in duck for blackmail. Uh, Yahoo is a great one. Uh, I'm sure many of you have had a Yahoo email address. I've had a Yahoo email address. Every Yahoo email address and password was stolen. Every one of them. Three billion of them were stolen. And in fact, for a while, they were giving data to NSA, it turned out. Uh, not, not the usernames and passwords. They were giving data to the NSA. And then they were, they were originally hacked in 2007 or something. They had been repeatedly hacked. And it was only recently discovered that, I, in fact, every password had been taken, right? not, just, not just a selected subset. Uh, GitHub is a, a, a website for, uh, for, software, for software development. So pretty much every, every piece of software that's developed now uses GitHub as a repository, uh, or, or a large majority of them. GitHub was attacked just a few months ago. It was what's called a denial of service attack. Basically, uh, all of a sudden, there was a massive load to the GitHub servers, and this, that shuts the service down for everybody else. Uh, Ukraine Power Grid was another famous one. The, the Power Grid was shut down. They lost power for a few hours. So, so the, the point is, this stuff happens everywhere. Let me just demystify this a little bit and explain what kind of attacks actually happen and what they really mean. So the first one is this idea of malware, which is some malicious software that gets installed on your, on your machine somehow. How does it get installed? Typically because users are careless. You get an email with some attachment. You say, well, let me look at that. You get a link saying, you know, click on this link for a million dollars from a Ukrainian or sorry, Nigerian something or the other. Boom, you click on that. Right? And then something gets installed. Uh, so once some malicious software is installed on your computer, you don't notice it. Nothing happens to the computer because it's there. It's just sitting there, and it's connecting that computer to a grid of computers that can be used to use that computer for some other future purpose. Right. That is most of the time what happens. Second one is this thing called phishing. Uh, it's a very, very common and very easy to perform attack. You get an email from your bank, from, from the army, from, from government, someone, with exactly the same format that you get the normal email. And in fact, if you look at the browser over to the link that you, and the email will say something like, uh, we found that you, you, know, you have to do something, or you were in this step, you didn't do this, please click here to finish the work. Right? And when you click on that link, it, even if you browse over, sometimes URLs will look just like that. In fact, there was a really interesting one, apple.com. So uh, English, the, the, there's something called Unicode that we use for characters for, for compu on a computer so you can represent any country's character. And the letters A, P, P, L, E, there are other character sets where the letter A, 
looks like the letter A, but it's not that same character. So somebody had registered a, a URL with the name Apple uh, with, with different Unicode characters. And so they sent a phishing attack with that thing. And most people looked at it and said, oh, this is apple.com. I'll click on it. And it's not apple.com. And then you get a login page saying login. This, by the way, is the number one way in which you start getting hacked. So first of all, pretty much every hack starts with a human being doing something wrong. And most of the time, it is you giving a username and password. Well, before that, actually, you're having a bad username and password, bad, bad password. Second one is you're giving it involuntarily to somebody who's going to attack you one way or the other. Phishing is the way you get it. Basically, you go and say, please log in to do something. When you log in, it says, no, sorry, incorrect password. And then it'll redirect you to the actual site. So you type in again, and say, oh, OK, I must have typed something wrong. I'm in. Right? But the, the, in the middle, they picked it up and, and kept the thing. So uh, the, one, the, the man in the middle attacks is something similar to that as well. A denial of service is the idea that, well, there's some service running, and I'm going to attack it with a, so much load that the service can't handle it. So nobody can use it then. So it shuts it down. <clears throat> Uh, the other two, SQL injection is more detailed, is attacking a database level. Uh, zero ex day exploit basically means there's some bugs that has been found and I'm trying to go after it. Who gets attacked? Everyone gets attacked. There's, no, there's nobody who's off the radar in terms of being attacked in a cyber attack. Uh, individuals, government, private sector, everybody is fair game. Now who's attacking? Potentially anybody. Because you don't know. It can be a government, it can be a state actor, it can be a non-state actor, it can be an intelligence agency. It can also be hacker mercenaries. There are plenty of mercenaries you can hire saying, I need, I need to hire, uh, you know, uh, this. So this is an example of like one terabits per second attack capacity, and it's $5,000. That's nothing to attack. One terabit per second, you know, most organizations in Sri Lanka wouldn't survive that attack. Uh, this brings uh, the, the other important point about a, a, all this digital dependency. So when we build digital infrastructure, Almost every digital service that we run on today is a, something coming from some other place. And these are international services. But legally, there is no such thing called international, right? There are no international companies. Companies operate under the laws of one country, some country. And therefore, that company, however much they say, no, 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 we are all good for you, are sub subjected to the laws of that country. So there is no independence when you depend on international services. This is a, this is a difficult challenge because there are no alternatives easily. But within an organization like a military, you cannot have international dependency. Neither, same for government. It's very difficult to have international dependency because it doesn't, the, the risk is too high. Because the politics can change, the rules can change, the world alliances and allegiances can change, and then you no longer have the right to use this software. And if you are depending on that, you're kind of stuck. And there's nothing you can do, but because tomorrow when you try to log in, you can't log in. Uh, so, so military is even more challenge because every piece of equipment we get going forward into the future is going to be digitally connected, digitally powered, one way or the other. And there's software in there. And there's software, you have no idea what's in that software. So you have to find a way to get involved with that so that it's not a black box. Because unlike in the other world, this software is going to be internet connected. That means the software can push out any data that, that you don't have any control over. Right? And it's very difficult to manage this especially because we do need to buy equipment. This is part of a necessary component. But at the same time, it is a significant risk. So it's find some way to build internal knowledge, internal capacity, so we don't just depend on external resources only for how you build uh, a digital military. Uh, there's a, the, the next speaker is going to talk much more about this, the idea that defending against cyber attack is not something that is going to be done by the military only. Unlike other theaters of war, where the primary responsibility for defense, in fact, almost all the responsibility for defense, belongs to the military, in the world of cyber, the military is only gets involved very little and often doesn't even know there's an attack going on. Because nobody goes through any normal international structures to come and attack you. It just connects to the internet, so you're fair game for an attack. Uh, so, 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 depend, so in order to be a part of that battle, one key thing is to build up the knowledge and become better and better at it so we can be part of the entire organizations that are involved with defending the infrastructure. Uh, one last slide before I finish. A, a, the key thing is uh, it's a lot harder to defend or, or cure yourself from an attack after you've been attacked. Right? It's much easier to be aware that these things happen, be aware of where the weak points are, which is usually people, and figure out how to improve that and, and go after those things proactively.
So crack your own passwords, for example, is a good thing to do. So you know who has a weak password. And look for patterns, look for ways in which people have been using things the wrong way. Uh, thank you. So in summary, a, a cyber is, is an entirely different game when it comes to warfare. It is not like the other areas, simply because everybody's fair game. You don't know who's fighting who. And no one who fights uh, looks like a fighter. Right? So terrorism was one step towards it, because somebody can hold a gun, and then in the evening they not hold a gun. They're no longer they're a civilian. This is like you don't even know when they hold a gun at all. Right? They're always holding the gun. You simply don't know it. The gun can be the phone that they're using. And you have no idea it's going on. A, a, and as, as a country perspective, I think this has been shared repeatedly, cybersecurity is, is something that is a key part of the national security, and it's something that we must develop in, in multiple forms, and offensive capacity as well. So uh, my last comment is, you have to be alert at an individual level. Almost guaranteed all of us have been hacked, and we simply don't know about it. Right? So the question is whether, whether you've been hacked in a way that you, you care about, and that case you'll find out because somebody will come after you. Thank you very much.